so that these people could tolerate the lights. And then they could begin to desensitize. Now, unfortunately, I got too smart too late about this, and I haven't really followed up with the, the borderlines. They, they found the experience uncertain. We didn't, you know, it was all experimental. We didn't know where we were going. They didn't get results in five days. So, you know, it's something now that I'm prepared to begin to follow up on with more certainty. Now, one of the problems, one of the distinguishing marks of, well, two of the distinguishing marks of head injured patients is um, they have a lot of activity down at the very lowest regions of the brainwave spectrum. In the delta region, they have a lot of, and this is basically asleep, they have a lot of activity down there, very high amplitude. A second is they have perhaps 10 to 15 times the number of small spikes in their, in their EEG or brainwave records. If you look at a regular classical EEG, you'll see very, very tiny spikes at certain locations. Um, their brains are irritable. Now, it would be interesting, and this is a long, this is a first in a long series of it would be interesting statements. It would be interesting to look at the brainwave records of, of, of people with borderline personality disorders to see whether there is any small spiking there, to see whether these people are more biologically irritable from that standpoint. It's clear that their physiology says that they're irritable. Now, it has enormous ramifications to begin to think of these people as having irritable brains and not just a socially induced or environmentally induced problem of that psychotherapy and long, many, many continentals worth of psychotherapy will, will fix up. A lot of really careful research needs to be done in this field. There's very, very little, if any, good research with clinical populations, people who have biologically based or psychologically based uh, problems. There are almost no controlled studies that I know of in this area. And uh, it's a project of mine with, with Bill to uh, put together some specific software that actually sets up controlled experiments so that the psychologist can design a, a procedure for each of several different conditions, the experimental and controlled conditions. And the psychologist, the therapist, the person running the system will not know what procedure is being followed. And we can set it up so that it's safe and begin to show, number one, that it is effective, the extent to which it's effective, and um, which parts of the procedure are effective. Because uh, I have no idea, frankly, whether the desensitization to the, to the lights and the sounds is primarily responsible for the improvement. Perhaps that in itself will do it. Perhaps it's the restriction in the range of the frequencies the, uh, for stimulation and the, uh, the desensitization to, that, uh, to those frequencies that's, um, uh, restrict, that, that's responsible for their improvement. Or perhaps it's something else. And I'll tell you a little bit about um, exactly what it is I do. And, I'm, and I have a, a guinea pig. And we can have a short demonstration of what this is. In contrast to all the work that's being done in brainwave biofeedback at this time, I don't try to speed the brainwaves up, or I don't try to slow the brainwaves down and leave it at that, or I don't shoot for a specific target frequency. What I do is I alternately speed the brainwaves up, slow them down, speed them up, slow them down, speed them up, slow them down. Now, you heard from Steve LaBerge about flexibility as an outcome. I see this as inducing a kind of flexibility. When a person is shocked, as goes through trauma, the brain may secrete some chemicals to protect itself from seizures in various other ways and in various other kinds of problems. And, um, 
And they may not, be, the good news is that it probably serves some protective purpose. The bad news is it probably also interferes with their functioning. And this stuff doesn't go away like it should. And in pushing and pulling and pushing and pulling and pushing and pulling, putting no particular spin on the brain waves, because I don't know enough to say what is the proper way for a brain to be operating. I'm going to leave that to, to nature for the, for the time being. Um, I push and pull. They get better. So whether it's this pushing and pulling and the, and the variability that I'm inducing, or whether it's the desensitization to lights or desensitization to frequencies, I don't know. We need a component analysis of that. Okay. Um, so I'm, now I'm going to demonstrate some of the software. Do you want to come up? Then I'm going to put the brainwave electrodes on. One of the questions that I get is, well, what about seizures? I work with people who have and, and have had seizures. Um, when a neurologist uses photic stimulation in a neurological exam to assess the presence and the character of seizures, that light is held on at a specific frequency for a certain length of time. Because I tag the frequency of the lights to, um, to, the person's, to the person's strongest brainwave frequency. And because that frequency is shifting all the time, the frequency of the lights is almost never stable. So it doesn't stay at any particular frequency. You can get seizures from uh, being in a shopping mall, from looking at a helicopter blade, from looking at Venetian blind. But they're pretty much stable signals. This is not a stable signal. I'm not saying that that's responsible for protection from seizures, number one. I'm not saying that we can't have seizures, because theoretically it's a possibility. And sooner or later, we have to be prepared for the possibility of someone having a seizure. And we have to know how the, the person who comes in has to know that. I'll bet you're surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I asked him before whether we had seizures. Um, but it's extremely remote. So this is basically the kind of signal that's working from Richard. Is that your? Yeah, Richard's brainwaves right now, okay? And this is low frequency. Now you have two missions. Um, one is to enjoy the light show. And the second, which is very important, and that is to tell me if anything becomes uncomfortable for you about that. And I can change things. And let me tell you what's uh, going on the screen, especially if I can disentangle this. I've got half a million dollars worth of equipment all over the place, and I have trouble disentangling the wires. Um, What you see in the upper left is a representation of the activity. Can you folks see? Am I in the way? OK. As a representation of the activity from a fast Fourier transform um, of what's going on in the person's brain. On the left are the low frequency brain waves, characteristic of drowsiness, and at the high frequency, which should be uh, around 30 hertz or cycles per second, um, uh, cognitive control uh, memory functions. There's a line there right underneath that called theta-beta ratio, which is a good indication of cognitive integrity. Um, actually, uh, the darkness to the left is really what the ratio is and not the, the light part. So the ratio is almost 3 and um, three to one. Um, you start getting up above that, and you find people getting increasingly flaky. When we were first doing, uh, or very creative. Um, <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> or perhaps both. Uh, 
when we were first doing the brainwave training, um, following Gene Peniston's protocol, he only stressed uh, alpha and theta feedback. And some of the people that I was working with who were beginning to really flake out, and one drove the wrong way up a freeway entrance and lives to tell about it, another one forgot how to get home. And we found out, he, both, he and I both found out about the same time, we really needed to change that procedure and, and include high frequency brain waves for some cognitive control. And the theta and high beta ratio is an indication of the uh, integra uh, integrity of the memory, I think. Um, I think, I suspect. If it gets very, very, very high or very, very low, um, then, uh, uh, then we've got problems. Up on top center, you see the, the figure called dominant frequency. That's the moment-to-moment -moment frequency of the strongest brain wave. Um, now, below that, immediately below that, is something called percent lead. And basically, uh, I am pulling his brain waves up at 5%. Now I'm going to pull the brain waves down. That 30 below that is you add 5% to the dominant frequency and you get a little bit larger number, 5% larger. What happens if we pull the brain waves lower? And I change that percent lead from 5% to minus 5%. So the lights are flashing a little bit more slowly than his strongest brain wave. 25, 9, 26. See, it's bopping around. One of, the, one of the problems that I see with some people is they, um, their range through which their brain waves goes gets rather restricted they get stuck. And they may have no low frequency activity to speak of. They may have very little high frequency activity to speak of. And I can begin to push them into these frequencies and out and pull them out of the frequencies. Again, kind of this variational approach, which basically allows them to begin to produce activity in the, in the, in the portion of the spectrum where they have not been producing activity. I can uh, put the brightness up to 100%. See what happens here. How is that going for you? Now, most of the people who are hypersensitive cannot take lights at that brightness. Okay. There's much more correlation here. You become locked in now, Yeah. What's the maximum on the scale? The maximum flashing is, is uh, 30 hertz. Yes. Okay, so if we can have the lights, and we'll free this poor victim here. Ask Richard what that was like, and I'm intimate. intimate. Oh, <laughs> well, I was conscious of having a, a crowd behind me because I've done this a lot before, and it was sort of like a real intimate experience. So um, having my brain waves on screen in front of all these people was something I was hard. It was hard for me to forget that. So I think that um, reflected a little bit on the experience I had. Um, and it was real short, so I didn't have time to like, get into it. I wanted to keep it short um, for a number of reasons, but primarily because it takes some getting used to.